So what I did in my book, uh, The Value of Everything, was to kind of bring it down to first principles and ask, could it be that also we've just kind of lost our way and stop really debating something that actually in the course of the last kind of 200 years of thinking about the economy was really central. This question of, you know, what is value? What is value creation? What is value extraction? And what happens when we, either by, my, by mistake or on purpose, end up rewarding value extraction more than value creation? Do we get something called value destruction? But, you know, I, I just keep using that word value there, but what is value? Um, and notice, by the way, that the subtitle is not makers versus takers, because that's really static. That would lead to the rest of my 40 minutes here kind of making a list of big, bad finance, hedge funds, credit default swaps, bad, and then kind of saying that something else is good. That's not what I'm going to do. I say, making and taking, the reason I chose that kind of verb is that we can change things. We can, and I hope perhaps we can talk about it also um, in the Q&A, um, we can fundamentally reform how finance is operating and how certain business practices have kind of gone astray and how government has just become a bit too lame. Um, but what's really interesting is that this kind of concept of making and taking kind of often comes back after every financial crisis. So I, I pulled out this quote here, which is, very nice one by Big Bill Haywood, um, the first industrial trade unionist in the US, writing at the time of the Great Crash in 1929. And it's, it's really interesting because you just replace the word gold barons by financial sector, and it kind of rings what a lot of people and communities around the world were saying. So the barbarous gold barons, they didn't find the gold, they didn't mine the gold, they didn't mill the gold, but by some weird magic, alchemy, all the gold belongs to them. Um, and so this is the kind of making and taking, and, and you know, this is kind of the accusation. Um, but so what does this mean? What does it mean to actually think about the economy in terms of certain areas being kind of productive, certain being unproductive, and really thinking about how to make sure we're steering activities inside what I call in the book the production boundary? Um, and unfortunately, what happens when we no longer talk about value and just kind of assume, you know, Silicon Valley is full of wealth creators, we end up allowing stories, literally just stories, and narratives and discourses about value and wealth creation to take over. And what I'm going to basically argue <laughs> is that when that happens, we allow value extraction to be disguised as value creation. And, you know, it's not that the landlords in the 1700s, and I'll get to them in a minute, weren't extracting value, but they didn't pretend to be innovative. They didn't pretend to be value creators. They just said, give me your damn money. And people gave them the money. Adam Smith called uh, landlords thieves. <laughs> um, there was no masquerading. And again, I'm not going to don't worry, I'm sure there's many uh, tech people here in the room. I'm, I'm not going to start making accusations of, again, whether it's tech or finance or, or, or government officials as value extractors, but this kind of masquerading exercise is a problem. And, you know, there's, I was really struck how one year, just one year after the crisis, the head of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, said with a completely straight face, it, it, it was not an after-dinner speech where he was trying to make people laugh. You know, completely serious, look it up, just Google it, and the FT put this quote, um, that Goldman Sachs workers were the most productive in the world. You know, I mean, this is a period where they had just been bailed out $10 billion by the US government uh, because of what happened with the financial crisis. There was plenty of evidence that it was, in fact, to a large extent, not only the activities of the large investment banks that at least partially <laughs> led to the financial crisis, and yet this bold statement of we are the most productive in the world. And so this whole concept of how do we measure productivity? Do teachers say we are the most productive in the world? And if not, could it be that how we are actually accounting for value in the system creates actually a self-fulfilling prophecy that it allows some actors in the economy to be very bold and arrogant and, and, and to be able to claim, even just logically, in terms of how we do the counting, that they are so productive. But then again, I, I mentioned story. So this idea that, again, wealth creators in Silicon Valley or in the case of Brexit, when uh, Brexit, I'm still hoping it doesn't happen, but... Um, 
happened, uh, you know, this idea that we had to at least protect those really valuable uh, 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 sectors which, which were producing value for the UK economy, so financial services. Um, and I'll mention also later the way that the word value is used in sectors like the pharmaceutical industry to justify very high increases in prices. So recently a price of an antibiotic went up by 400% overnight, and the idea that value-based pricing could somehow be used to uh, justify that is quite extraordinary. And on the opposite spectrum, I've already mentioned teachers. You don't hear teachers calling themselves, we are so productive, but also the state itself, how we talk about the state. We don't talk about it really as creating value. At best, we talk about it as redistributing value or enabling or de-risking the value creators. So these are really just words and narratives and discourses, which are kind of just, I don't want to say bullshit, but just kind of stories, right? Economics is not nuclear physics. And we've allowed, by not actually talking about value, these stories to be out there and almost not even questioned. Mm -hmm.